The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al -Asi. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Muslim Perspectives. I'm Zafar Bangash. The Quran is Allah's uh, revealed word to humanity to guide it through this wayward world. Muslims read the Quran for many different reasons, uh, whether it is to seek blessings uh, or guidance, but often it is only to seek blessings. Whereas the Quran is supposed to be our guide from the womb to the tomb. Of course, we do have a, a number of translations of the Noble Quran in many different languages. There are many translations in the English language as well. But translations uh, are not adequate in terms of understanding the real precepts of Islam. Uh, except in so far as uh, providing us a glimpse into the meanings of the Quran. In order to understand the Quran fully and properly, there are obviously uh, tafsir. Now, a tafsir is a much broader explanation of the noble Quran, uh, such as uh, commentary on its uh, ayats or verses. Uh, giving background to the time of revelation because that is also significant, the historical factors at that time, and so on. And based on that, we are able to understand the Quran better. Obviously, there are different tafasir and different scholars have uh, given uh, different interpretations depending on the time frame that they lived in. And since uh, humanity continuously changes and makes progress. Therefore, it is important that the Quran is interpreted in the light of new developments. Now, there is now a tafsir of the Quran being produced uh, in the English language, uh, the first ever tafsir that is being produced in the English language. And this is being done by Imam Muhammad al-Asi, one of the greatest Quran scholars uh, in North America. And he has uh, given a meaning to this Quran in a way that is unique. And today we are fortunate enough to have uh, Imam Muhammad al-Asi with us. And we are going to talk to him about the Quran and some of the concepts that are uh, narrated in this glorious book. Uh, Imam Muhammad al-Asi, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me over. Now, let's start off with this uh, basic question. Uh, there are many tafsir out there. Uh, what is special about the tafsir that you are working on, of which I have um, a few copies here? It is uh, referred to, uh, the title is The Ascendant Quran, uh, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Could you please shed some light on why your tafsir is first of all necessary and why and how it is different from other tafsir. I think a little background information is due pertaining to um, the genre of tafsirs. Uh, first of all, the word tafsir simply means, um, well, it means exegesis and that simply means explaining the meanings of the verses of the impeccable Qur'an. And there have been many uh, scholars who undertook the effort of explaining the meanings of the Holy Qur'an. Con in our contemporary world, I don't know of any uh, in our time frame right now who is doing it. 
But in the past century, there have been at least a dozen mufassirin. And then if we go back to the classical times of hundreds uh, or a thousand years ago, we'll find also dozens of mufassirin. Mufassir is the person who's doing the tafsir. Now, some of these tafsirs have um, a, an aroma or a flavor, a peculiar aroma or flavor to them. Some of the explanations of the Qur'an uh, concentrate on the language of the Qur'an. The Arabic language is a uh, flowery language. It's a beautiful language. It's an eloquent language. It is a refined language. And some of these mufassirin, they concentrated on the linguistic composition of the verses and the chapters of the Qur'an. Other mufassirin concentrated on explaining the meanings of the Qur'an, relying basically on the hadiths, the statements of Allah's final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his. Other mufassirin, they relied upon... Um, uh, a historical narrative of the meanings of the Qur'an. Uh, and yet others, uh, they may have introduced certain philosophical or rational concepts in explaining the meanings of the Qur'an. You're asking me about the tafsir that I've been working on now for many years. I would say the concentration of this tafsir is to highlight um, a very important and central meanings and issues in the Qur'an that pertain to power and authority. So how and why do power and authority matter? I know it's a very delicate very sensitive, and in some people's minds, it's a very controversial thing to do. But the fact of the matter is that uh, the, the conflicts that we have in today's world center around the issue of power and authority. Uh, who has legitimate power? Who has legitimate authority? Contrast that with who has illegitimate power and who has illegitimate authority. Revolutions are made out of this stuff. Oppression is made out of this stuff. So this is a very important issue to concentrate the minds of people on when they read this book of guidance that has come to humanity from the Creator. And unfortunately, this area itself, which I am concentrating on, this area has gone uh, unnoticed practically by many <coughs> students of the Qur'an. And therefore, I thought uh, I would render a service uh, to the Muslims and non-Muslims, whoever is looking for guiding information. Uh, to bring to light the meanings. Let, let me put it this way. Maybe this makes it a little easier for people to understand. Let's say, you know, we're speaking about Allah, the one God. Let's speak, we're, we're speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you, if you uh, have a discussion with a Muslim or a non-Muslim about God, and you say God is uh, very merciful, Everyone agrees. You say God is loving. Everyone agrees. You say God is compassionate. Everyone agrees. And so you, you find that there is an agreement on a lot of issues. But where is it that people begin to have a different point of view or do not want 
to think about which which is it in when speaking about God that people either don't want to speak about or uh, they have differences about it's the it, when it comes to God's power and God's authority then here you begin to have people speaking about well you know if God has power and authority that power and authority belongs way up there in heaven. It has nothing to do with our human society here, which is obviously, for anyone who is reading the Qur'an, not applicable. And then when you look at rulers in this world, I don't want to be naming names and pointing fingers, but we, we take a look at rulers in this world. Are they practicing legitimate authority and legitimate power? Or more basic question, what makes power legitimate or illegitimate? And what makes authority legitimate or illegitimate? So what makes it legitimate or illegitimate? Be when it belongs to God, it's legitimate. When it doesn't, it's illegitimate. It's that simple. And people will, you know, people will have different ways of approaching this. That is why there are different verses in the Qur'an in explaining this. And we are following this course of the Qur'an in explaining this whole affair so that you know, confusion will not settle into men's affairs and everyone, no one knows where the answer to all of this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the answer. Only thing we have to do is open our minds and heart and listen and tune in to what Allah Jalla wa Ala is saying. Can you give us some examples so that our viewers can better understand this? Well, yes, I'll give you an example. I think one of the uh, common, um, maybe, uh, historical narratives that Jews, Christians, and Muslims have is the story of the Pharaoh and Musa, Moses. Uh, there was a conflict here as to who has power and who has authority. The Pharaoh says, it's me. Musa is saying, no, it's God. So there is a conflict here. And Musa and the Pharaoh were not arguing whether God is merciful or not, whether God is loving or not. They were arguing well, who has legitimate power and who has legitimate authority? And everyone, I think, knows what happened, what transpired between both of these points of view that resulted in the Pharaoh drowning and Musa delivering uh, the children of Israel from the tyranny of the Pharaoh so that they can live in a world in which Allah or God is the ultimate power and the ultimate authority. Given all of this, uh, in the Muslim world, uh, there are rulers that uh, perhaps uh, offer their salat regularly. They may even fast in the month of Ramadan. They go for Hajj and, in fact, indulge in all of these rituals. Uh, yet, uh, hardly any of them would qualify to be a legitimate ruler from the Islamic point of view. Why? Well, you force me to confess that the Muslims, generally speaking, especially in the past more than in the future, I see that there's uh, Muslims are in a transition now, but for the past, I don't know, hundreds of years, Muslims have been living in an age of ignorance pertaining to their own reference, which is the Qur'an. We've been living in... And it doesn't appear only in the Qur'an itself. It appears in other pursuits of life. Muslims have been ignorant when it comes to industry. Do Muslims have an industrial base? No. Muslims have been ignorant in the pursuit of scientific research. Look around. Look in the Muslim world. And... Equally so, Muslims have been ignorant pertaining to their own, I don't use the word religious, but I'm going to, to their own 
religious book of authority, the Quran itself. So when they don't, when the Muslims themselves don't understand what what the Quran is telling them, then they create a vacuum, and then you have nature abhors a vacuum, and societies abhor a vacuum. So when we create this vacuum, there are others who will come in and occupy this vacuum. And that's what exactly what happened. When our minds, between our minds and the Qur'an, there's a vacuum, then you have those who have their own theories and their own ideologies and their own philosophies. They come in and fill that vacuum. They fill it with their school systems. They fill it with their educational programs. They fill it with their media. They fill it with their academics. They fill it with their scholars, their think tanks, etc. They filled all of this in, and then they began to tell us what the Qur'an is, it means. They now are explaining to us what the Qur'an means. So obviously this area of power and authority they don't want that explained because if they explain, and I, I, I want to say something here, I think Orientalists who are uh, schooled in a very uh, s uh, serious way in what Islam means, they know exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to the issue of power and authority in the Qur'an. So they don't want this knowledge to become public knowledge among the Muslims because if it does, then the Muslims are going to be independent of these power structures, colonialists, imperialists, uh, occupiers, colonizers, uh, invaders, etc. Muslims are going to be independent of them and then they're going to begin their own journey back to the meanings of the Qur'an and resume their civilizational role in world affairs. They don't want that to happen. You talk about social justice. How is it different from the understanding of a common man of justice as we understand it? And what is social justice? Yes, I'd like to say that to summarize the meaning of the Qur'an and or I'll go further to summarize the meaning of all of God's revelations to mankind from time immemorial until the end of time the meanings that God exalted be he dispatched to different societies at different times in the annals of history are focused on one word, and that word is justice and social justice. And there's a verse in the Qur'an that says that, in Surah Al-Hadid. So, this revelation is a revelation that is, may I use the word, obsessed with justice. And um, there can be no viable and lasting peace without this social justice. Impossible. There may be some temporary peace. There may be some partial temporary peace in the sense that time-wise we'll, we'll have peace in a, in a certain area for a certain amount of years and then that peace will diminish. Or we may have partial peace. We will have peace in a certain segment of society for a certain amount of time and then that type of peace will evade us. But to have uh, a permanent and an extended meaning of peace, peace needs justice. Uh, our greetings to each other is summarized in the word peace. And it is because of the ignorance that I just referred to in the previous question 
that many Muslims are not able to see the relationship between justice and peace. And it's not only in Muslims reading their own divine script, it is also in the political jargon and vocabulary uh, that is out there in the world. It, it, we go through election cycles. How many people speak about justice? You pay attention. Next time someone's running for high office, whether it's a president or prime minister or whomever, count the time of how many times the word justice or more to the point, social justice. How many times are they going to mention the word social justice in presenting their program or their agenda when they become the ultimate decision makers in their countries? It's basically non-existent. In the Quran, there are many injunctions relating to individual responsibility, to family responsibility, to societal responsibility, community responsibility, even state responsibilities. And yet, uh, most Muslims uh, indulge in rituals. Why is that? Well, yeah, there's two words in the Quran. One of them is adil, which means justice. The other one is qist, which means social justice. Now, I'll explain to you justice as um, an elementary, organic, individual um, responsibility. I'm responsible for justice to myself, to my family, maybe to certain individuals in my circle of livelihood. I'm responsible for justice there. But when we say social justice, we are talking about in the, the institutionalization of that organic and that personal justice which becomes the building block. Social justice is not the responsibility of a person. Social justice is a responsibility of a society. So the... the, the um, the extent of justice that is the ambition of our faith and our commitment to God, our Creator, is not just to be selfish and have justice only when it comes to me and my extensions, but we go beyond that and we have to feel responsible for having justice um, uh, permeate all segments and all levels of society. And that's a function of what we call today a government. Social justice, just like justice is a function of a father or a brother or let's say whoever is in charge of maybe a family unit, justice is required therein. But when we come to the larger society, we take that a step further and we say, instead of looking at justice in a family, we're looking at social justice in a people or in a society. So, uh, so social justice is organized justice, institutionalized justice, quote-unquote, legalized justice. In the Quran, uh, many different concepts are used, uh, such as justice, and of course closely related to, to justice is uh, the concept of peace. Could you please shed some light on these? Once again, ignorance. Muslims are ignorant. They don't read the Qur'an to be a book in real life for real-time uh, issues and efforts and activities. When we Muslims ourselves cannot understand or we cannot place the Qur'an in its extended scope, then all of this is a sad comment on our reading of the Qur'an. This is one of the issues that has always... Um, um, knocked on my head, so to speak. 
and that is many Muslims honor the Quran emotionally. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and that is uh, commendable. But what is lacking, and this is dangerous, what is lacking is Muslims do not um, mentalize the Qur'an. They emotionalize it, but they don't mentalize it. Could you please uh, explain that? Yeah, the meanings of the Qur'an. The Qur'an has meanings. The Qur'an speaks to your mind. Let, let me give you an example. You take, the, the Qur'an has over 6,000 verses. I don't know, 6,500 or 6,600 in that area, verses. Out of that amount of verses, the verses that have to do strictly with rituals are not more than 140. Out of the 6,000, and 500 plus ayat in the Qur'an, only 140 of them have to do with rituals. Well, what are the other ones speaking about? Has any Muslim who's reading the Qur'an ever asked himself, I've reduced all of my understanding of the Qur'an to a salah and the zakah and the hajj and the umrah, and that's about it. Okay, those are 140 ayat. What about the, the rest? You know, the number of verses in the Qur'an that speak about what in today's world is called uh, scientific research or scientific discoveries or uh, scientific probes, the number of ayat in the Qur'an are around 750 that strictly deal with this particular ayah. Now, if you enter into, I, I, I'm not saying this to you personally, but to everyone who's watching and listening, you go to an Islamic library or go to an Islamic bookstore and look at the books there on the shelf that are for sale. Look at all of the books that are there from beginning to end. How many, I ask, how many of these books are going to be explaining to you the meanings of the 750 ayat in the Qur'an, which is about five times more than the ritualistic ayat of the Qur'an. How many of you are you going to see on the shelf? Practically, well, maybe if you're lucky, you'll see maybe five or ten. If you're looking at a library or bookstore that has thousands of books in it. Five or ten! What, what type of... Uh, this, uh, this is... I mean, it's hard to be self-critical sometimes. But this is the type of world that we are living in. The Qur'an almost has been abandoned when it comes to the, the rich uh, mental uh, fertility that is in the Qur'an. I'm afraid we'll have to stop here because we are out of time, but uh, we'll definitely continue this discussion uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. We are greatly uh, appreciative of your input. And you're very welcome. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Uh, you've been watching Muslim Perspectives. Um, please make sure that you tune in again to the same channel, same time. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, until then, I'm Zafar Bangash. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Mm-hmm.